In March of this year, now Justice Ketanji Brown Jackson sat before the Senate Judiciary Committee for confirmation hearings for her historic nomination. Jackson, who would later be confirmed by a 53 to 47 Senate vote, made history as the first black woman and first former public defender to sit on the highest court. In her confirmation hearings, sparks flew, courtesy of Republican inquisitors like Senator Josh Hawley. Hawley repeatedly pressed Jackson on her record as a judge and her alleged leniency in sentencing for convicted criminals found guilty of heinous offenses towards children. Hawley is a hardline conservative on crime and alleged that Jackson could not be trusted to defend victims against perpetrators. His accusations were consistently refuted by Democrats like Judiciary Committee Chair Dick Durbin. The Missouri Senator ultimately voted not to confirm Jackson to the Supreme Court. For lunch, is that okay, sir? Judge? All right, we have uh, Senator Hawley of Missouri. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Judge, congratulations on your nomination. It's nice to see you again. Congratulations to all of your family. I know that this is a big moment for you and for them, and rightly so. I enjoyed our meeting a couple of weeks ago. You know, as I've said to folks who've asked about it, one of the things I particularly appreciated about our meeting, besides how much time you gave me, was how candid and forthcoming you were, which I really respected. And uh, I look forward to a candid conversation again in the days that come. And by the way, I'm admiring how you're sitting so uh, stoically through all of this, uh, all this senator talk. But uh, I'm looking forward to visiting with you again. You did me the, the honor when we sat down of being very candid. And uh, I hope I was candid with you. I've been candid since. I want to be candid with you today so you know exactly what it is I want to talk about. And uh, so you know exactly where my head is at. So let me, let me say, a few things that I'm concerned about, aspects of your record that, that trouble me. This will come as no surprise. I've said it in public already, but I want to be, again, very candid in the interest of an open and honest discussion and specific. So here are, I hope, in the next couple of days, some of the cases from your time on the, on the court, the district court, the federal district court, that I hope that we can talk about. Let me just run few, uh, through a few of them so you know exactly which ones I mean. United States versus Hawkins. This was a child pornography case where the defendant distributed multiple images of child porn, possessed dozens more, including videos. The federal sentencing guidelines recommended a sentence of 97 to 121 months in prison. Prosecutors recommended 24 months in prison. Judge Jackson gave the defendant three months in prison. United States versus Chazen, there it's the, that case the defendant possessed 48 files of child pornography the federal guidelines recommended 78 to 97 months in prison. The prosecutor recommended the same. Judge Jackson sentenced him to 28 months. United States versus Cooper. There the defendant possessed dozens of images of child pornography and uh, distributed, I should say distributed dozens of images of child pornography, possessed over 600. The federal guidelines recommended 151 to 188 months in prison. That's a long time. The prosecutor recommended 72 months. Judge Jackson gave the defendant 60 months, which was the lowest sentence permitted by the law. United States versus Down, that's a case where the defendant distributed 33 graphic images and videos of child sexual assault to an anonymous messaging app, unfortunately, a practice that's becoming more common. The federal guidelines recommended 70 to 87 months in prison. The prosecutor recommended 70 months in prison. Judge Jackson sentenced him to only 60 months. Again, that's the lowest level that was permitted by law in that case. United States versus Stewart. The defendant there distributed scores of images of children suffering sexual abuse. The guidelines recommended 97 to 121 months in prison. The prosecutor recommended 97 months in prison. Judge Jackson gave him 57 months. In United States versus Sears, the defendant distributed over 100 videos of child pornography. The guidelines recommended 97 to 121 months in prison. The prosecutor recommended 97 months in prison. Judge Jackson gave him 71 months. In the United States versus Savage, the defendant was convicted of traveling across state lines to engage in sexual intercourse with a child and also possessed six separate thumb drives of child pornography the guidelines recommended 46 to 57 months in prison. The prosecutor recommended 49 months in prison. Judge Jackson sentenced him to 37 months in prison. Now those are seven cases that represent, as near as we can tell, all of Judge Jackson's cases dealing with child pornography from her time on the district court, in which she had some discretion to hand down a sentence. There's some other cases in which the law, she didn't have any discretion, the law bound the sentence that she had to, 
had to give. And what concerns me, and I've been very candid about this, is that in every case, in each of these seven, Judge Jackson handed down a lenient sentence that was below what the federal guidelines recommended and below what prosecutors requested. And so I think there's a lot to talk about there, and I look forward to talking about it. Now, I will note that some have said that the federal sentencing guidelines are too harsh on child sex crimes, especially child pornography. I've heard that argument a lot in recent days. The chairman quoted someone earlier today who takes that point of view. I'll just be honest, I can't say that I agree with that. I mean, the amount of child pornography in circulation has absolutely exploded in recent years. Here's a New York Times report from 2019, I'm quoting now. Last year, tech companies reported over 45 million online photos and videos of children being sexually abused, more than double what they found the previous year. The report goes on to say this, 20 years ago, these online images were a problem. 10 years ago, they were an epidemic. Now the crisis is at a breaking point. Unfortunately, it's even worse than that. Just last week, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children reported finding 85 million files of child pornography in, in 2021. And of course, this committee has heard testimony from prosecutors and others who are grappling with the problem of, of how to get at this porn and those who distribute it, how to prosecute them and hold them accountable. Here's my point. I, I think it's difficult against this backdrop to argue that the sentencing guidelines are too harsh or outmoded or that we should be somehow treating child porn offenders more leniently uh, than the guidelines recommend. But I want to be clear about this, that those arguments that I've just been rehearsing, those who say that, I, those aren't, that's not what Judge Jackson has said. She hasn't had the chance yet to respond to this, and she deserves that chance. So others have made these arguments. I don't agree with them, but I think it's important we hear from Judge Jackson, and we'll have the chance to in coming days. And I, I think, again, the, the candor that Judge Jackson has shown previously, I look forward to, and she deserves the ability to speak for herself on this issue. So I will just say, in closing, Mr. Chairman, some have asked, why did I raise these questions ahead of the hearing? Why not wait until the hearing and uh, spring them on Judge Jackson, as it were? And my answer to that is very simple. I'm not interested in trapping Judge Jackson. I'm not interested in trying to play gotcha. I'm interested in her answers because I found in our time together that she was enormously thoughtful, enormously accomplished, and I suspect has a coherent view and explanation and a set of thinking, way of thinking about this that I look forward to hearing. And I think she deserves the chance to talk about it. I think the American people deserve the chance to hear her answers. So they're my concerns, Judge. They're the cases, I, I imagine there'll be others that we can talk about on other subjects, but I'd like to talk about those. So. You know exactly where I'm coming from. Thanks again for giving me the time a few weeks ago. Congratulations again. I look forward to finally hearing from you tomorrow. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Hawley. Uh, certainly the judge deserves to be heard on that type of a charge. Senator Corono. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Corono. Then we're going to take a 20-minute break uh, because that's when we think there'll be some votes on the floor. We can take care of those and get back in 20 minutes. Then we'll, we will return from that break to Senators Cotton and Booker. Then we'll take a 30-minute break or so for dinner. Then it'll be Senator Kennedy, Padilla, and Tillis. And we're going to start off tomorrow with our two um, Senators Ossoff and Blackburn. So we should finish in the 9 to 10 o'clock hour this evening, God willing. So at this point, uh, I recognize Senator Hawley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Judge, nice to see you again. Thank you again for being here. Congratulations again on your nomination. I, I want to start uh, where Senator Blumenthal left off. I want to talk with you about some of these cases. I mentioned them yesterday, so I know you know which ones I want to talk about. The seven cases, child pornography cases, in which you had discretion. They came before you. You had discretion to sentence one way or another in these seven cases. Not every case, of course, do you have discretion. Sometimes the law requires you to impose a sentence, certain sentence. But in these seven, you had discretion, and in each of these seven, you chose to depart both from the federal guidelines and also from the government's, the prosecutor's recommendations. Senator Lee's asked you a little bit about this. Senator Cruz has asked you about it. He had a chart with the seven cases on it. Before we jump into those, I just want to correct the record on one or two things. Senator Coons suggested that in three cases, Nickerson, Wynn, and Fife you actually impose sentences either within the guidelines or at the same level of the prosecution. But in Nickerson, you didn't have any discretion. That was an 11C1C case. The law bound you. And when wasn't a child porn case, and neither was Fife. 
Uh, just one other quick thing to clarify. As to these comments about the probation office, the probation office doesn't issue national guidelines, right? I mean, the probation office doesn't issue sentencing guidelines. They're not public. They're not recommended to all judges. The probation office provides advice to judges case by case, usually in private, usually not available to the public. Is that right, Judge? Not exactly, Senator. The probation office in uh, criminal cases is assigned by the court to work with respect to the evaluation of cases, in every case consistent with Congress's requirements, the probation office prepares a pre-sentence report in which they review all of the statutory factors concerning sentencing. Congress has a statute for sentencing. It requires uh, judges to consider the nature and circumstances of the offense, the history and characteristics of the defendant, the need for the sentence imposed to promote various purposes of punishment. There are many purposes listed in the statute. And the probation office is the arm of the court that does factual investigations in every criminal case, unless you, there are certain cases in which you can waive it. But the background is the probation office's assessment of the facts related to uh, a particular sentence and a, a particular crime. And the, the probation office's report, when a court sentences, actually, uh, in most cases, becomes the findings of fact of the court. And so the probation office appears just like the prosecution and the defense. The probation office has written a report, and they make a recommendation to the court based on their independent analysis related to the facts of a particular crime and defendant and sentence. Understood. So they, they give the court counsel, understood. Uh, however, they don't issue guidelines. They're not uniform. It is by its very nature a case-by-case -case inquiry, as you said. The report goes to the judge. As I understand it, the, the pre-sentencing report, I'm sorry, the probation reports are, are not public in all of the cases that we're talking about here. I'd love to see them if they are. But uh, it's not as if there's one set of guidelines that are federal sentencing guidelines and then there's the probation guidelines. The probation office is giving advice to the judge. It varies case by case. Senator, but it's not, it's, oh. not, it's not the same. <laughs> Sorry, but, I thought you were done. No, that's all right. Let, let me ask you about a specific case. I mean, let's talk about, I, I listed these seven cases in which you had discretion and you did not follow the prosecutor's recommendation or the sentencing guidelines. But let's just talk about one of them because we've talked about some of them as a group. Let's talk about United States versus Hawkins. I think that's one you probably remember from 2013. The defendant there was Wesley Hawkins. He was 18 years old at the time. He uploaded five video files of child pornography from his computer to YouTube. This is how the police got onto him. He then uploaded another 36 depictions of child porn and, and other lewd photos of children to his iCloud, iCloud account. When the police executed a search on his apartment on the premises, they found 17 videos on his laptop and 16 images of child pornography, uh, all of them uh, very graphic, uh, some of them involving very young children. The 17 videos in particular, this is from the government sentencing memorandum in this case, just so we understand the facts. Here are some of the videos that the government uh, charged and they recovered. There was a 24 and six, uh, 24 minutes, six second video depicting a 12 year old male committing a sexual act. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna read exactly what it was. There was a one minute and 57 second minute video depicting an eight year old committing a sexual act. There was an 11 minute and 47 second video depicting an 11 year old committing a sexual act and being raped by an adult male. There was a 15 minute and 19 second video depicting two 11 year olds committing sexual acts. There was a seven minute and 51 second video depicting a 12 year old committing a sexual act. So as the government said in this case, and I'm quoting now from the transcript of the sentencing hearing, 17 videos is a lot. And some of the videos, including the ones that are described in the statement of the offense, and I've just 
related, some of them, are very lengthy and include numerous images, numerous views, sometimes collages, sometimes multiple victims. You see the act in progress. The government goes on to describe some of these as sadomasochistic images. So this is, this is a tough case. This is one of those tough cases you were referencing earlier. You talked about it this morning. You said these cases are terrible. This is one of them. This is terrible stuff. This is not a good guy who's doing this stuff. Guidelines recommendation in the case was 97 to 121 months. So if I'm doing my math right, that's up to 10 years. And in this case, the guidelines recommendation was essentially written by Congress because in the PROTECT Act of 2003, Congress specified what they wanted the range to be in these kind of cases. And Congress also specified what they wanted the mandatory minimums to be. I know you remember the PROTECT Act because you've, you've talked about it. You've, you've given lectures on it. And it was enacted, as I said, in 2003. It was 84 to 0 was the, was the vote here in the Senate. The concern, the reason the PROTECT Act was put into place is the Senate was concerned over lenient sentences by judges in child porn cases, uh, which is what you described. You said about it, there was an increasing perception on Capitol Hill and within DOJ that liberal judges were to blame for the downward pressure on federal sentences and that legislation was necessary to rein them in. Uh, that's you in 2011 describing this law. So Congress has set the guidelines here, 84 to nothing in the Senate. I noticed the chairman voted for it, as did a number of other members of this committee. So the Congress sets the range. Essentially, it's 97 months up to 10 years. Now, the prosecutor in this case, this is in D.C., of course. You're on the federal district court. The prosecutor in this case, it's a, a, uh, a liberal administration. I think it's fair to say. This isn't the state of Texas. I see my colleague from Texas next to me here. The prosecutor in this case, nevertheless, still asked for two full years in prison. You gave the defendant three months. Guidelines called for 10 years. Prosecutor wanted at least two. You gave him three months. And when you did, you made a, you made a number of arguments and statements in the record, and I'd like to go through some of them because I've read them all. And the first argument you made was that the federal guidelines that punished child porn offenders, the ones that Congress wrote, were, and I'm quoting you now, are in many ways outdated. That's your quote. And you went on to say about why you thought they were outdated. I'm going to quote you again. You say, and I quote, I don't feel that it's appropriate to increase the penalty on the basis of the number of images or prepubescent victims, meaning little kids, as the guidelines require, because these circumstances exist in many cases, if not most, and don't signal an especially heinous or egregious child pornography offense, end quote. I just want to ask you about that because I just have to tell you I'm having a hard time wrapping my head around it. We're talking about 8-year-olds and 9-year-olds and 11-year-olds and 12-year-olds. He's got images of these. The government said added up to over 600 images, gobs of video footage of these children. But you say this does not signal a heinous or egregious child pornography offense. Help me understand that. What word would you use if it's not heinous or egregious? What, what, how would you describe it? Thank you, Senator, for letting me address the concern that you've put forward based on the record that you've reviewed. As a judge who is a mom and has been tasked with the responsibility of actually reviewing the evidence, the evidence that you would not describe in polite company, the evidence that you are pointing to, discussing, addressing in this context is evidence that I have seen in my role as a judge. And it is heinous, it is egregious, what a judge has to do is determine how to sentence defendants proportionately consistent with the elements that the statutes include, with the requirements that Congress has set forward. Unwarranted sentencing disparities is something that the Sentencing Commission has been focused on for a long time 
in regard to child pornography offenses. All of the offenses are horrible. All of the offenses are egregious. But the guidelines, as you pointed out, are being departed from even with respect to the government's recommendation. The government, in this case and in others, has asked for a sentence that is substantially less than the guideline penalty. And so what I was discussing was that phenomenon, that the guidelines in this area are not doing the work of differentiating defendants as the government itself indicated in this very case. And so that's what I was talking about, but I wanna assure you, Senator, that I take these cases very seriously, that these cases include the notion by many defendants that the folks at issue, that the defendants themselves are collecting these images on the internet, they're terrible things that have happened, but they're not involved, say, the defendants. They're not focused on, you know, what is actually happening to the children. And so part of my sentencing was about redirecting the defendant's in attention. It's not just about how much time a person spends in prison. It's about understanding the harm of this, this behavior. It's about all of the other kinds of restraints that sex offenders are ordered rightly to live under at the end of the day. The sentences in these cases include not only prison time, but restraints on computer use, sometimes for decades. Restraints on ability to go near children, sometimes for decades. All of these things judges consider in order to affect what Congress has required, which is a sentence that is sufficient but not greater than necessary let me just to promote you. the purposes of Sorry. punishment. Yeah. Well, let me just ask you about that last point, because you've said this a couple of times now, the, the, the sentences that Congress require. Congress wanted the guidelines to be mandatory. Congress wrote the guidelines in this case. They wanted them to be mandatory. They gave the courts factors to consider to choose between the sentencing range. Congress wanted you to choose between 97 and 121 months. That's what Congress wanted. The Supreme Court in Booker said that the, sentence, the sentencing guidelines would be discretionary, so the Supreme Court gave you the discretion. But if we're talking about what Congress has wanted, Congress wanted them to be mandatory. My only point in raising that is just to say that you had discretion in these cases, and you used your discretion to, to choose the sentences that you did. Let me ask you about some of the things, though, that you said, because you said this this morning, and I, I appreciated it, how you want to direct the defendants. You want to get them to own up to what they've done in these cases. And I thought that was powerful, and I thought it was right. But let me just ask you about what you said to this defendant. You said to this defendant, to whom you sentenced to only three months in prison, that your collection, I'm quoting you, your collection at the time that you were caught was not actually as large as it seems. The government felt the need to respond to you on the record. They said the government doesn't believe that it's appropriate to just disregard the number of images, that the number of images can be appropriate. And indeed, in this case, the defendant has amassed an extremely large collection of child pornography. But you disregarded that. You also told the defendant, you said this, this seems to be a case where you were fascinated by sexual images involving what were essentially your peers. And then you went on to say, the defendant was merely trying to satisfy his curiosity. Curiosity is your word. One more thing on this, same idea. You said you were viewing, this is you to the defendant, you were, div you were viewing sex acts between children who were not much younger than you. And this whole discussion is about why you're only giving him three months. Judge, he was 18. These kids are eight. I don't see in what sense they're peers. I've got a nine-year-old, a seven-year-old, and a 16-month-old at home, and I live in fear that they will be exposed to, let alone exploited, in this kind of material. I don't understand you saying to him that they're peers and that, therefore, you were viewing sex acts between children who are not much younger than you and that that's, that's somehow a reason to only give him three months. Help me understand this. 
Senator, I don't have the record of that entire case in front of me. What I recall with respect to that case is that unlike the many other child pornography offenders that I had seen as a judge and that I was aware of in my work on the Sentencing Commission, this particular defendant had just graduated from high school. And some of, perhaps not all when you were looking at the records, but some of the materials that he was looking at were older teenagers, were older victims. And the point, Senator, is that you, you said before, the probation office is making recommendations and they do so on a case-by-case -case basis. That is what Congress requires. That, it, this is not done at the level of but you had discretion, Once, Judge. You admit that, right? I just want to be clear. Senator, uh, sentencing is a discretionary act of a judge, but it's not a numbers game. It's not, I, I understand that Congress wanted the guidelines to be mandatory. The Supreme Court in 2005 determined that they couldn't be, in an opinion by Justice Scalia, determined that they couldn't be, and Congress since then has not come back to amend them or to change them or to make them mandatory again. And so there is discretion at sentencing. And when you look at the sentencing statutes, Congress has given the judges not only the discretion to make the decision, but require judges to do so on an individualized basis, taking into account not only the guidelines, but also various factors, including the age of the defendant, the circumstances of the defendant, the terrible nature of the crime, the harm to the victims, all of these factors are taken into account and the probation office assists the court in determining what sentence is sufficient but not greater than necessary. And I appreciate, Sen Senator, that you have looked at these from the standpoint of statistics, that you're questioning whether or not I take them seriously or I have some uh, reason to uh, uh, handle them in either a different way than my peers or a different way than other cases, and I assure you that I do not. That if you were to look at the greater body of uh, not only my more than 100 sentences, but also the sentences of other judges in my district and nationwide, you would see a very similar exercise of attempting to do what it is that judges do. Attempting to take into account all of the relevant factors and do justice individually in each case. Well, let's keep talking about, about this case. You also said to, to this individual, who is an adult, tried as an adult, 18 years old, you also said to him, besides saying that you thought his victims were his peers, you also said there's no reason to think that you are a pedophile. And then you went on to say, again, that's another reason why you weren't going to give him, you're only gonna give him three months because you would have judged that he wasn't a pedophile. And then you said, and this is something I'd, I, I really need your help understanding, then you apologized to him and I, I just have to tell you, I can't quite figure this out. You said to him, this is a truly difficult situation. I appreciate that your family's in the audience. I feel so sorry for them and for you and for the anguish this has caused all of you. I feel terrible about the collateral consequences of this conviction. And then you go on to say, sex offenders are truly shunned in our society. I'm just trying to figure out, Judge, is he the victim here or are the victims the victims? You're saying that you are, you're apologizing to him. You're saying you're sorry for the anguish this has caused him. There was a victim impact statement in this case. It didn't get read into the record, but it was there. I've described the, the videos that we have. You say earlier in the case, you talk about how heinous these crimes are and you describe them to your credit. You describe how heinous it is to your credit and yet, here you are giving him three months 
and apologizing to him and saying you feel sorry for the anguish it's caused him and also saying you think that sex offenders are truly shunned in our society. So just just talk about that. Help me understand. I mean, is, is he a victim? Is that your view here? Is that why you said this? Is that what you meant by Senator, it? Senator, I, I, again, don't have the entire record. I remember in that particular case, I considered it to be unusual, in part for the reasons that I described. I remember in that case that defense counsel was arguing for probation, in part because he argued that here we had a very young man, just graduated from high school. He presented all of his diplomas and certificates and the things that he had done and argued, consistent with what I was seeing in the record, that this particular defendant had gotten into this in a way that was, I thought, inconsistent with some of the other cases that I had seen. Part of what a judge is doing, as required by Congress, is thinking about this case, thinking about unwarranted sentencing disparities, that's in the statute, other cases, other determinations that a judge may have made about this. I don't remember in detail this particular case, but I do recall it being unusual. And so my, my only point to you is that judges are doing the work of assessing in each case a number of factors that are set forward by Congress, all against the backdrop of heinous criminal behavior. But the guidelines are no longer mandatory. Congress has not corrected, as you would say, the Supreme Court's determination about that, Justice Scalia's decision that the guidelines are not mandatory. Congress has not said that. And Congress has given judges factors to consider. This, in my view, was an unusual case that had a number of factors that the defendant was pointing out, that the government was pointing out, that the probation office was pointing out. And I sent this 18-year-old to three months in federal prison under circumstances that were presented in this case because I wanted him to understand that what he had done was harmful, that what he had done was unlawful, that what he had done violated the law and, and needed to be punished, not only by prison, but also by all of the other things that the law requires of a judge who is sentencing in this area. But, but Judge, with all due respect, and I'm, I, I, I'm telling you, what, I'll be direct with you. I am questioning your discretion and your judgment. That's exactly what I'm doing. I'm not questioning you as a person. I'm not questioning your excellence as a judge, frankly. But you said it. You had discretion, and I, that's exactly what I'm doing. I'm questioning how you used your discretion in these cases. And to me, to take a guy who's 18 years old, who has what the government says is an extremely large collection of prepubescent pornography, eight-year-olds, 10-year-olds, 11-year-olds, we're talking about, I mean, gobs of hours of, of time here that he has, and you say to him, what, that you say that, well, you know, it was, it was just a collection. I mean, he was just viewing it, and it was, you know, essentially they were his peers. You say to him that he's not a pedophile. I don't know how you know that. I don't know why that's relevant to the guidelines, but may, maybe it is. You say he's not a pedophile. Um, you say that you're very sorry for him and what he suffered, and then you give him three months when, frankly, a liberal prosecutor is asking for two full years. I mean, it does seem like an extraordinary case to me. It would bother me no matter what. It really bothers me when in every case, child porn case you've had, you've had discretion, you've sentenced below the guidelines and below the government's recommendation. And saying that sex offenders are truly shunned in our society, as you said to him, it it reminds me, it echoes what you said as early as law school on that Harvard Law Review article Senator Blumenthal was just talking about. There you say, and I'm quoting you now, in the current climate of fear, hatred, and revenge, 
associated with the release of convicted sex criminals, courts must be especially attentive to legislative enactments regarding these sex criminals. I guess like, like this, the enactment here, the, 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 uh, the Protect Act that Congress enacted. So I, I, wanna, I wanna try to understand here, is it your view that society is too hard on sex offenders? You say they truly are shunned in society. You wrote that many of these laws are products of a climate of fear, hatred, and revenge. So just, is that, is that still your view? I mean, do you think that these, that these laws are too tough, that we're too tough on sex offenders? Explain what you meant. In this case, in 2013, and it seems to be the same thing you said many years ago. Senator, it's not the same thing I said many years ago. Many years ago, as a law school student, I was evaluating a new set of legislation, state laws about registration, and I was analyzing them as law students do. It wasn't about the sex crime. It was about the characterization of the law. Is it a punitive law? Is it a prescriptive law? And how would a court go about determining that? That was the frame that I used then. It could have been about anything. It was about the characterization of legislation. But, but could I, just to, I don't, I'm sorry, I don't mean to interrupt you. I've only got two and a half minutes left, but I just want to make sure I understand this. This is, I'm quoting from your conclusion now. This is on page 1732, 1728 of the, of the Harvard Law Review. This is your conclusion. In the current climate of fear, hatred, and revenge associated with the release of convicted sex criminals, courts need to be especially attentive to legislative enactments. So you, that's a conclusory statement. You're saying that there is a climate of fear, hatred, and revenge that are informing these laws. And you described some of the laws earlier, I think, Megan's Law and others. Senator Cruz asked you about some of those. I, I, I just am trying to understand what you meant by that, because you're saying something similar in the Hawkins case. You're saying that society truly shuns our sex offenders. So, Senator, um, with all due respect, my uh, article is now in the record. People can read it, and they can see that I was evaluating these laws not to determine their constitutionality, not to uh, say that they shouldn't be enacted, but to talk about the ways in which courts make determinations about the character of the law and all of the consequences that follow from them. In law school, I had not had any uh, experience in, in terms of the criminal justice system, and I was doing what law students do, which is uh, seeking to analyze in a creative way new legislation. With respect to Mr. Hawkins, I was doing what judges do, which is look at the statute, 18 U.S.C. 3553A, exercise discretion as Congress has required us to do, take into account all of the various aspects of a particular case and make a determination consistent with my authority, my judgment, and understanding fully the egregious nature of the crime. As you said, even the prosecutors in these cases are not recommending guideline sentences. The probation office, which is an independent authority, looking at these cases and the facts related to them, are not recommending guideline sentences. This is a particular area where the commission has seen an enormous amount of disparity and has in fact asked Congress to come back and address to, to help judges who are looking at these cases to be able to rely on the guidelines. Which Congress has declined to do. Senator, in that case, we have the statute that Congress has enacted concerning penalties, and we have judges who are doing their level best to make sure that people are held accountable as they need to be in our society in a fair and just way. Mr. Chairman, I have, my time's expired. I have, thank you, Judge. Uh, I have no further questions at this time.
Just checking with my staff. So the original statute was passed in 2003. The Scalia decision, 2000. See you again. Good to see you, Senator. We don't uh, have a lot of time, so let me just get straight into it. Uh, Senator Cruz was asking you at the end of, of his time and questionings about United States versus Stewart. This is the case where Neil Stewart tried to cross state lines to rape another person's nine-year-old daughter. He had 6,700 images and videos of egregious and brutal child pornography. The government recommended 97 months. The guidelines said 97 to 121 months. You came in at 57 months. Senator Cruz asked you why. The chairman wouldn't let you, let you answer. I thought maybe you'd like to answer now. Thank you, Senator. No one case can stand in for a judge's entire record. I have sentenced more than 100 people in a variety of egregious circumstances. In every case, and especially cases that involve the kinds of acts that you're talking about, the kinds of evidence that I had to deal with as a judge, in every case, I am balancing the factors that Congress has determined are appropriate and required for a judge to make a determination. The data points that Senator Cruz pointed to that you may have in front of you don't account for all of the information that was before me as a judge and the authority that you all, Congress, and your prior confirmation when I was a district judge provided for me to exercise my judgment, and I treated those cases and every case very seriously and imposed a sentence that was sufficient but not greater than necessary to promote the purposes of punishment. Would it surprise you to learn that Mr. Stewart's a recidivist? He was warrants issued again for his arrest just three years after you sentenced him? Would it surprise me? Yeah. Would it surprise you? You know, Senator, um, there is data in the Sentencing Commission and elsewhere that indicates that there are recidivism, serious recidivism issues. And so uh, among the various people that I've sentenced, I'm not surprised that there are people who reoffend. And it is a terrible thing that happens in our system. Yeah, indeed it is. Let me ask you about the Hawkins case. You and I talked about this yesterday. You've been able to think about it overnight. This is a case where you had an 18-year-old who possessed and distributed hundreds of images of eight-year-olds and nine-year-olds and 10-year-olds, and you gave him, frankly, a slap on the wrist sentence of three months. Senator, Do you I don't, regret it? I don't remember whether it was um, distribution or possession in it the law. It was both. Do you regret it? In, in the law, there are different uh, crimes that people commit Judge, in you gave this him area. three months. My question is, do you regret it or not? Senator, what... I regret is that in a hearing about my qualifications to be a justice on the Supreme Court, we've spent a lot of time focusing on this small subset of my sentences, and I've tried to explain. You regret that we're focusing time. on your cases? I don't understand. No, you. no, no. I'm, I'm, I'm talking about the fact that you're talking about Child seven pornography cases? very serious cases. I'm glad we agree on that. Don't you some, think we should be some, focusing on some of which, Some of which involve conduct that I sentence people to 25, 30 years. Three months before. in this case, Judge. Do you regret it? You haven't answered my question yet. Senator, Do you regret the sentence? Senator, I would have to look at the circumstances what I'm telling you... You you know the circumstances. We discussed it for half an hour yesterday. There's a 55-page transcript, which I'm sure you've read. You I lived it. Not, As you've not. emphasized to this committee over and over, you've lived it, right? You said that you've been through all of this. You've looked at all of the images. You're the one who's had to endure all of it. You gave him a three-month sentence. I just wonder if you regret it or if you stand by it. I mean, do you stand by that sentence? Senator, in every case, I followed what Congress authorized me to do in looking to the best of my ability at all of the various factors that apply, that constrain judges, that give us discretion, but also tell us how to sentence. And I ruled in every case 
based on all of the relevant factors. So you don't regret it? No one case, Senator, can stand in for a I'm not asking that. I'm record. asking if you regret this sentence in this case. And it sounds like the answer is no. But I want to tell you, I regret it. I regret that you gave him only three months. Let me read to you what you said about these kinds of cases. In fact, to this defendant, you said, make no mistake, Mr. Hawkins, the children you saw in those pictures were not willing participants in the conduct that you witnessed. They were being forced to commit unspeakable acts of sexual violence for the pleasure of the person who was filming and for the gratification of sick people everywhere, people who apparently have no shred of empathy for what this must be doing to the children who are being abused in this way. You go on, some of the children you saw in those pictures will never, never have an adult, a normal adult relationship. Some of them will turn to drugs and prostitution and other vices to try to deal emotionally with the pain that results from the torture that they have experienced. And even those who manage to lead a somewhat normal adult life say they live in constant fear of being recognized. Some people are even unable to leave their houses because once those pictures are on the internet, they are there forever. And the victims can't do anything without worrying that every person that they meet has seen them in their most vulnerable state at the most horrible time in their lives. That's your words, pages 34 and 35, the transcript. Powerful words, Judge. I just don't understand why after saying this and believing this, you could give this guy three months in prison when the probation office that we've heard so much about recommended 18 months. Even the probation office recommended 18 months. Do you have anything to add? No, Senator. Let me ask you about your policy of not giving enhancements when there are prepubescent children, like there were in the Hawkins case, who are eight, nine, 10 years old, when there are prepubescent children involved. I don't, I, I'm just struggling to understand this. You said it in Hawkins, you said that you weren't going to give him an enhancement, you weren't gonna give, make his sentence any tougher, despite the fact that we had all of these terrible videos that you and I talked about at length yesterday. This is page 38 of the transcript, just so that we're all following along. You said, in your case, I don't feel that it is appropriate necessarily to increase the penalty on the basis of your use of a computer, and we've talked about that, or the number of images or prepubescent victims as the guidelines require, because these circumstances exist in many cases, if not most, and they don't signal an especially heinous or egregious child pornography offense. You said the same thing in the Cooper case just last year. This was an individual, Cooper, who was 30 years old at the time of his sentencing. He pleaded guilty to distributing child pornography. He posted between three and four dozen images of child exploitation to Tumblr, where it could be accessed publicly. The government said, and I'll quote from the transcript in that case, page 37, when his devices were found, including the computer, within the computer and on an untitled folder were many, many, many videos. The nature of these videos went well beyond mere child pornography. The government says, I don't mean to make light of the content of any child pornography, but rather to say that the content of those videos is on the more egregious or extreme spectrum of the child pornography videos that are encountered in these cases. And yet when you sentenced him, you said, I'm quoting now from the transcript in Cooper, I'm really reluctant to get into the nature of the porn. And then later, it's very difficult to assess how different Mr. Cooper's images are than those of other similarly situated child pornography dependent, uh, defendants, rather, such that I, without going into looking at them, and I'm not an expert, you say. So you say, while I understand the government's arguments, Mr. Miranda, the government's arguments in that regard, I don't find them persuasive from the standpoint of characterizing this as an especially egregious child pornography offense. Help me understand this, Judge. Why is it that you, what's your policy disagreement with the guidelines treating images, videos, porn pornographic images that have small children, infants, seven, eight, nine-year-olds, why won't you give an enhancement for those? Help me understand that. Thank you, Senator. I'll make two responses. First, that's not my policy disagreement. I don't know why you've characterized that in that way. Well, wait a minute, I wait a minute. You say, you say right here in the cases, I mean, this is, this is the, what I want to get, I want to make sure that we're talking about the same thing here. This, in the Hawkins case, I don't feel that it's appropriate necessarily to increase the penalty on the basis of your use of a computer or the number of images or prepubescent victims. And you say the same thing in Cooper. 
Senator, two observations. One, I am sentencing in every case. I have policy disagreements with certain aspects of the operation of the guidelines that I lay out in every case as Congress has required and as the Supreme Court permits in light of my experience, not only as a district judge, but also on the Sentencing Commission, which did a report about the operation of the guidelines. Second, you've read extensively from the government's argument in this case. You've not provided information from the probation office or the defense. And I, when I a don't judge, have the probation office report. No, excuse me, Senator. The probation office provides a, a recommendation. There has been information gathered about what a recommendation was given in each one of these cases. I don't have that information here, but what I'm saying is that in every case, the judge is not just hearing from the government. The, the, the judge is not just evaluating what the government says in these cases. In every criminal case, a judge has to take into account all sorts of factors, including arguments being made by the defendant, by the government, by the probation office. So I understand that in certain cases, the government may have made an argument, but there are other people in our criminal justice system who make arguments, and the court evaluates everything as Congress has directed, and no one case can stand in for my entire record of how I deal with criminal cases or did when I was a district judge. I have law enforcement in my family. I am a mother who has daughters who took these cases home with me at night because they are so graphic in terms of the kinds of images that you are describing. They give you not only the actual videos, which you can ask to see, but they describe in the briefs in detail what these videos show. So I am fully aware of the seriousness of this offense and also my obligation to take into account all of the various aspects of the crime as Congress has required me to do, and I made a determination seriously in each case. Uh, what I'm trying to understand is why is it that you say multiple times that just because there are prepubescent victims in Cooper, in Hawkins, that that does not signal that this is a heinous or egregious child pornography offense, and you're not going to apply any sentencing enhancements that the government's asking you for. The sentence gets to be less because you say, I'm not going to apply. The government asked for enhancements related to prepubescent children, related to the, the nature of these images. You say, I'm not going to apply it. But I get, what you're telling me is, I guess, that you, you don't have a policy objection? I mean, why, why didn't you apply the enhancements as they were asked for? Senator, I've answered this question many times from many senators who've asked me, so I'll stand on what I've already said. So you have nothing to add about, about why these crimes, why these images, in your view, do not signal an especially heinous or egregious child pornography offense. That's Hawkins, you say in Cooper, I understand the government's argument, but I don't find them persuasive, the fact that there were prepubescent children, from the standpoint of characterizing this as an especially egregious child pornography offense. That's page 58. Let me ask you this. You said, Senator Graham, to Senator Graham earlier today that you were trying to do what's rational, and you didn't in sentencing in these cases, and you didn't think it was rational to sentence people who had thousands of images by using a computer to the sentencing guidelines, to the, man, to the mandatory range. I'm sorry, it's not mandatory, to the no longer mandatory range, the discretionary range. No, Senator, I said the guidelines system is designed to be rational. Okay, so let me ask you this. Why isn't it rational to sentence people who have thousands of images on a computer to more time as opposed to somebody who has one or two pictures in the mail. In other words, the more images there are, why wouldn't you want to sentence that person to more time rather than less? Why isn't that rational? Senator, I've answered this question, and I'll stand on what I already answered. 
So, but, but your answer is what? I mean, refresh my memory. Senator, I've answered this question. I've explained how the guidelines work, and I'll stand on my answer. But the guidelines are not mandatory. I wish they were, but they're not. The Supreme Court made that determination. I'm trying to understand why you think it's rational not to sentence criminals based on the number of images they have. You say that this is a policy disagreement that you have with the guidelines. This gets to the core of your judicial philosophy. You served on the Sentencing Commission where you recommended changes to the guidelines based in part on this policy disagreement. So I think it's relevant and indeed vital we understand what the policy disagreement is. That's what I'm trying to get at here. Senator, I previously explained what the policy disagreement is and I will stand on my answer. So you're not gonna answer my question? No, I've answered your question and my answer You is haven't I've answered my question. I'm sitting here asking you and you're declining to answer. I've explained how uh, the guidelines work. I've explained that um, the guidelines were developed at a time in which the commission of this crime was different than it is today. I've explained that Congress has not uh, intervened to uh, revise or direct the commission around how to deal with the changes in the commission of this crime. And so judges all over the country are grappling with uh, how to apply this guideline under these circumstances. And there's ex an extreme amount of disparity. And in each case, a judge has to look at all of the factors, not just the guidelines, not just what the government asks for, but the recommendations of the probation office, the arguments of the government and the defense, the nature and circumstances of the offense, the history and characteristics of the defendant, the need for the sentence imposed to promote the purposes of punishment, which include things like rehabilitation. Also, in every case, Congress has authorized judges to impose not only terms of imprisonment, which are a very important part of the consequences for these crimes, but a range of other uh, uh, preventative kinds of measures which courts impose in cases to prevent these defendants from repeating these egregious, uh, uh, this type of egregious conduct. And I talked uh, to each defendant, as you have quoted, explaining to them the harms that their crimes caused. And I imposed not only a term of imprisonment, but also all of the other consequences of the offense to include decades of supervision, restrictions on use of a computer, and the like. That's my answer. I've answered it many times. Do you have other questions for me? Um, yeah, I do. I, I do, because I, I want to I try to understand when you talk about the guidelines being outdated and outmoded. I understand that they were written, the initial guidelines were written at a time when computers were not common, everybody didn't have one, certainly didn't have phones in every pocket like we do now, smartphones. So I understand that. I also understand that the number of images sexually exploitative images of children on these devices has exploded. And so I'm trying to get at what Senator Coons earlier characterized as a pretty fundamental policy question, which I think is the correct characterization here. I'm trying to understand your view on why it is that while the images, the number of images available on these things has exploded, that sentencing shouldn't track that. You see what I'm saying? I mean, you've made the argument, if I understand you right, and I want you to correct me if I'm wrong, you've made the argument that, well, Look, the guidelines were written at a time when this stuff was like it was it was an individual picture, it was, you know, magazines, whatever. Now almost every offender, I, I think, this is the argument, so you correct me. Almost every offender, because of the nature of this, they've got tens, hundreds, sometimes thousands. I mean, be, partly because of the nature of this. My question to you is, wouldn't we want to deter that? Isn't that a reason to impose tougher sentences? I mean, Senator, go ahead. The the Congress has every ability to do that. What's happening now is that you have a guideline that has gradations in it for the number of images that ends up being, when you look at the scale, something like the difference of 10 years. I'm making, I, I don't know exactly what it is, but each, each two level enhancement is like several years. And the gradations are like 
zero to, and again, I don't have it in front of me, but it's like zero to 50 pictures, 50 to 100 pictures, 100 to 150 pictures, set up at a time in which the mail was the primary mode of possession and distribution. And so if somebody had 50 pictures, they, according to Congress and the commission at the time, deserved an extra 10 years in prison. Now, with that scale, everybody's at the top immediately, just because of the nature of the internet. So you're not differentiating using that scale anymore, given the way this crime is committed. And so judges are having to decide, how are we going to deal with the penalties and do our jobs to impose sentences that are sufficient but not greater than necessary under these circumstances. Yep. Thank you, Judge. I'll just I'll just say in closing that I, I appreciate that answer and I understand that as a policy matter. I just think we disagree. I think that somebody the more images are there, the more punishment there should be. And I want to see this deterred. And I just think we've pretty fundamentally disagreed. I've enjoyed our exchanges. Thank you for your candor and uh, I appreciate it. I, I just disagree with you on the law. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Hor <clears throat> thank you, Senator Hirono. Senator Holly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I enjoyed uh, the opportunity to meet with Judge Jackson in person several weeks ago. I found our exchanges here on the committee after almost an hour of questioning to be very substantive and very thorough. And based on the answers that I heard from her then and in response to my other colleagues, I can say definitively that I like her. I think she's a good person, but I cannot support her. And I want to say a word or two as to why. We heard from her. She told me this actually when we sat down together in our meeting, and she said it again under oath that she has no particular judicial philosophy. She's said in response to questions that she has no view on whether or not people have natural rights, curious. She told Senator Blackburn she can't define what a woman is, but the one thing that she seemed to be very comfortable saying quite definitively is that she thinks the US federal sentencing guidelines for criminals are too harsh. She said it repeatedly here under oath. We've talked about it at length. Her record reflects it. And I just want to say that I agree with my Democrat colleagues on this point, at least. When it comes to a judicial philosophy, it probably is true that the best way to ascertain a nominee's judicial philosophy is to look at their record. And for days, that is exactly what we have done. I sat with the nominee and went through 55 pages of transcripts in her cases. We talked about multiple cases, other Senators questioned her on this score as well. And when you look at her record in depth, her consistent policy position is that the federal sentencing guidelines are outdated, they are outmoded, they are too harsh, and that criminals in general are oversentenced. And I just have to say, I couldn't disagree with her more. You know, she's very clear in her cases, and I commend the transcripts of her cases to everyone who is interested. If you read the transcripts of her cases, when she sentences criminals, and particularly in the child pornography cases that we've discussed so much, she routinely says that she has significant policy disagreements with the federal sentencing guidelines. She's very open about this. I mean, she, this isn't a secret. She's very open about it. And again, it's very clear in the child pornography cases in particular. This is why in 100% of those cases where she had discretion, 100% of the time, she sentenced below the federal sentencing guidelines, below the prosecutor's recommendations, and we now know, frequently, below what the probation office confidentially recommended. In the Hawkins case, in the Sears case, in the Cain case, in the Hilly case, we now know she recommended below or sentenced below what even the probation office recommended in their confidential reports to her, and she did it based on policy. And for me, this is very key. This is a very thoughtful person. Judge Jackson is not someone who's just wandered in here. She's very accomplished. She's very thoughtful. She was on the bench for 10 years, has been on the bench for 10 years, served on the Sentencing Commission before that. She's given these issues a great deal of thought. And I think that her views on these issues as it relates to sentencing and criminal justice are very well considered. I just disagree with them very fundamentally. Here's the policy that she discussed with us and that she has repeatedly discussed in her cases. She says that she disagrees on principle. When it comes to these child pornography cases, the criminals should be getting a higher sentence based on the number of images they possess. That's what the guidelines say. 
You should get a higher sentence based on the number of images. She repeatedly says, for the record in these cases, and she said it here to this committee, to me, to Senator Graham, to Senator Cruz, and others, that she thinks that that is wrong as a matter of policy. I think that that is fundamentally mistaken. The more images there are, the worse the crime is. The number of children being sexually exploited and images made of child sexual exploitation isn't decreasing, it's exploding. In 2019, the New York Times reported after an investigative survey that there were 45 million images of children being sexually exploited on the internet. Last year, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children said that number was up to 85 million. 45 to 85 in the space of just two or three years. I just disagree with Judge Jackson when she says that we shouldn't be sentencing criminals based on the number of images they possess. I think in this age, in this set of circumstances, she's fundamentally wrong and the guidelines are right. She says that she disagrees on principle with the enhancement for using the computer, using the internet. She made that very clear. She says it in the cases over and over. Fair enough, but I think she's wrong. In an age when child exploitation is driven by these images that are exploited, are, are distributed through the internet, through computers, to set aside computer use as a reason to give a higher sentence, to ignore the guidelines on this, I think is a mistake. I think it is a very fundamental mistake. She said that she doesn't give enhancements based on the sadistic nature of the images. She said that over and over in the cases we looked at. In the Hawkins case, she says it. In the Cooper case, she says it. I also think that that is fundamentally mistaken as a matter of substantive policy. I do think that if you have a criminal defendant who possesses images that are sadistic in nature, where children, babies, are being sadistically sexually abused, that person ought to spend more time in jail. I do think that is worse than a criminal of, an, of another variety, of another type. And I'm not the only one. Prosecutors including a prosecutor who testified to us two weeks ago, who are experts in human trafficking, have made the same point. This, this prosecutor who was before us here on the committee, she spent 18 years prosecuting these crimes. Her testimony was an offense that involves a computer is worse than an offense that involves the mail. An offense that involves more images is worse than an offense that involves fewer. An offense that involves young children is worse than an offense involving older children. Judge Jackson's view is that we should treat everyone more leniently because more and more people are committing worse and worse child sex offenses. I'd say exactly the opposite is what we should be doing. If more people are committing worse child sex offenses, if there are more images, if the images are more graphic and exploitative in nature, then more people ought to be spending more time behind bars. And here again, I would submit to you that her judicial philosophy on this point is why she is consistently sentenced below not just the guidelines, not just the prosecutors, but as we have seen, the national average in these cases, and even below her colleagues in the D.C. Circuit. And by the way, Judge Jackson's aware of this. If you look at the transcripts of her cases, Judge Jackson, to her credit, by the way, she's very thorough, Judge Jackson frequently will ask the U.S. Sentencing Commission for data on what the averages are for this kind of a crime in other courts and in her court. In the Cooper case, for instance, Judge Jackson, this is another one of the child porn cases, Judge Jackson looked to statistics about the average sentence given to similarly situated defendants. She asked the Sentencing Commission to calculate this. Her own statistics, or the, really the Sentencing Commission statistics, revealed that she sentenced Cooper, in this case the defendant, to 41 months below the national average. I know that because she knows it. She cites it. It's in the transcript. Here's my point. Judge Jackson, as a matter of policy, sentences below the national averages, below her colleagues. And by the way, the prosecutors know it. Read the transcripts. The prosecutors come into court, and when they appear before her, they say, Judge, we know that you have policy disagreements with the guidelines. We know that you think they over-sentence. We know you think they're too harsh. They know it. They argue with her based on it. Some cases pleading with her, you know, at least give the defendants, in the Hawkins case, this is the 18-year-old who had thousands of images, all those videos of, of young children. They plead with her, at least give him two years. That was below the guidelines. At least give him two years. She gave him three months. I think this is why, this core judicial philosophy is why we see her doing things like apologizing to some of these offenders, just like she apologized to Wesley Hawkins. She said she was sorry for him. Now listen, I just have to say, 
I'm not sorry for him. I'm not sorry for these offenders. I am not sorry for the offenses they have committed and where they have gotten themselves to. They should go to jail. They should go to prison. And my fundamental disagreement with Judge Jackson is not based on her character or her integrity or her accomplishments. I think those things are beyond question. It's based on her policy and her philosophy. And I think on these core issues, she is just dead wrong. Now, let me just say this finally in conclusion. We've heard in Judge Jackson's defense, and I don't know it's really much of a defense. I know she didn't say these things, but in her defense by the White House and members of this committee, we've been told things like the child pornography is actually all a conspiracy. It's not real. It's just a conspiracy. It's made up. Let me just say for the record, sex crimes against children are not fiction. They are not a conspiracy. There are 85 million images of children being exploited available on the internet. I'm a former prosecutor. These are real crimes. I'm a father of three young children. These are real children. And these aren't victimless crimes. Just because they're images doesn't mean real kids aren't involved. As Again, as we heard testimony from prosecutors and experts just two weeks ago, child pornography creates a cycle of trafficking, of exploitation, of abuse. It is the children here who are the victims, not the criminals. On that core point, I disagree fundamentally with Judge Jackson. I wish her well, but I cannot support her nomination. Thank you, Mr. Chairman.